Hello, and welcome to a daily dose of Deacon Harold. It is Wednesday in the fourth week of Easter. And uh, the beautiful um, picture that you see behind me, painting, is in the Church of the Visitation. You remember yesterday, uh, I had a picture of the Church of the Visitation. As you walk into the church in Jerusalem, you uh, turn to the left, and you that's where the altar is, and, and I showed you the the scene behind the altar. And if you look right, this painting is uh, almost takes up the entire back wall of the church. Again, it's the Church of Visitation in, um, in, in Jerusalem. Beautiful, beautiful uh, place. And um, uh, if you ever get a chance to go on pilgrimage with me, you know, have the, no more pilgrimages this year, of course, when we start resuming pilgrimages again next year, and we go to the Holy Land, I hope you are uh, going to come with me. I think it's going to be scheduled for um, uh, for May of next year. I think is what, what we're going to do to Holy Land. But we'll get more information about that as soon as we have those those dates solidified. Um, uh, but you'll see this beautiful uh, uh, painting behind me, and one of the most beautiful churches. Uh, and, and, and what I love about it too, you have the Magnificat in all the different languages all around the uh, the perimeter of the church. There, uh, just a, a beautiful sight, and. Um, I uh, hope you get a chance to come with me one day. That'd be awesome. Uh, today, I want to just acknowledge a couple of people. One of them is my friend uh, and uh, a theologian, author, and a Catholic speaker, David Gray. David did a review of my book on Father Augustus Tolton, which talked about lessons we can learn from his life. I'm grateful to David uh, for, his, for his kind words. And he totally understood what I was trying to do in that book. You know, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, I'm going to return the favor next week uh, during one of my daily doses. I'm going to be talking about this book, The Divine Symphony, uh, an exordium on the theology of the Catholic Mass. Uh, Dave has written like four books. I have all of them. And uh, this is, I think, my favorite one out of all the books that he's written, uh, The Divine Symphony. Just a beautiful uh, uh, exhortation, uh, exordium, as he says, on, on the Mass, on the whole sacrifice of the Mass, both um, word and sacrament. Uh, it's uh, really inspirational. So I'm going to share my thoughts with you uh, about this book uh, next week. So thank you again, my friend, David L. Gray. And check him out on, on uh, Facebook, uh, David L. Gray. And also check out his uh, uh, YouTube channels where he has tons of videos on there. All right, I also want to uh, acknowledge a couple of, a couple of uh, longtime friends of mine, uh, Ken and Janelle Yasinski. You know, back when I uh, was very early in my speaking career, even before I decided to leave my job and speak full time, uh, I was still working full time then, and I was I was speaking every now and then, and uh, I was invited by Ken and Janelle uh, as part of a, a ministry they had back then called Face to Face Ministries up in Saskatchewan, Canada. I was traveling to Canada, pre uh, you know, pretty often back then, and um, got a chance to meet them and got a chance to work with them. And uh, they invited me several times to different events up there, uh, and we had a, an amazing time. And there were um, three different things I want to mention quickly that really struck, stuck out to me. One of them was when I spoke at, um, uh, it's, it's called the St. Therese School of uh, Faith and Mission in Saskatchewan, Canada, in Bruno, actually Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, it's a school of evangelization and mission. And I got a chance to give some talks there. And also an amazing event uh, called Rock the Mount Youth Rally. It was at the uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Shrine. It was like an amphitheater kind of thing outdoors. It was phenomenal, all day event. It was great. I absolutely loved it. The atmosphere, the vibe, the people. Um, and, and one thing is that is characteristic of um, uh, what Ken does. And, and Ken, by the way, Phenomenal speaker. He's speaking full time now. It's a full time speaking evangelist. If you're looking for someone for your parish, Ken is the man. He is awesome. Great presentation, amazing content. Uh, CatholicSpeaker.com. CatholicSpeaker.com. Ken Yasinski and uh, his wife, Janelle. Uh, Janelle has a, a faith and fitness uh, thing that she's doing on Facebook. So check them out. Ken and uh, Janelle uh, Yasinski. Y A S I N S K I. And, uh, but one thing that was, um, and I think Ken still does to this day, is Eucharistic Adoration as, as part of his mission, as part of what he does during parish missions. And they used to have these at all their events back, back in the day. 
Uh, this is why we're talking about 2007, 2008, right in that area there. And I, and I always love the Eucharist, Eucharistic Adoration. If people know me, know I'm a Eucharistic Adoration, Adoration junkie. And I remember one time in Adoration, I was kneeling, and there was a, a gal sitting next to me. I never forget her name was Elliot Fole. Uh, she's married now, so she has a hyphenated last name. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but, but her name was Elliot Fole. And um, she was kneeling next to me. And then during adoration, she started singing, like spontaneously. I think um, Kim was playing and she just started to sing. And, you know, usually I'm more of a quiet adoration kind of guy, but I got, I got to tell you, man, I, I, man my hands shake. I, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. She started to sing and her voice just elevated me. I mean, it just took me to a whole nother place. Uh, I, it was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had in Eucharistic adoration. Uh, it, it brought tears to my eyes. It was just a, a Holy Spirit filled a few minutes there while she sang. And I was just, I was just, I just wanted just to, to, to revel in it. You know, I didn't want it to stop that kind of experience. You know, it was just, I mean, I never, and I've never had experience with singing adoration like that since then. So uh, uh, Elliot was phenomenal. So, and Carissa too, Chris was part of Face to Face Ministries back then. So I wanna uh, uh, thank her as well. So again, Ken and Janelle Yuzinski, check them out, good friends. So we are on day six. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing my uh, Notre Dame shirt. This is one of those, this is kind of like a beat around shirt, you know, like. You know, it's just one of those days today. You know, <laughs> I don't feel like doing a whole lot. You know, just throw on a shirt. So I'm wearing one for my alma mater, Go Irish, uh, class of 88. Yeah. So uh, we're on day six of our um, Immaculate Heart of Mary Novena. And so we'll start off, as we always do, with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Immaculate Virgin, by the holy will of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you are our Mother in Heaven. Your immaculate heart is full of love, mercy, and compassion for sinners like us. We ask that you intercede for us today for, and please hear mention in your heart or out loud, your particular need or intention that you'd like the Blessed Mother to ask her son to intercede on our behalf. We trust your intercession before the throne of God for our needs. Please pray also that if our requests are not in accordance with the will of God, that we may be like you, conform to his will and not our own. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now the act of consecration. Most Holy Virgin Mary, tender mother of all, to fulfill the desires of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the request of the Vicar of your Son on earth, we consecrate ourselves and our families to your sorrowful and immaculate heart, O Queen of the Most Holy Rosary. And we recommend to you all the people of the country and all the world. Please accept our consecration, dearest mother, and use us as you wish to accomplish your designs in the world. Our most sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, queen of the most holy rosary and queen of the world, rule over us together with the sacred heart of Jesus Christ, our King. Save us from the spreading flood of modern paganism, kill it in our hearts and our homes, the love of purity, the practice of a virtuous life, an ardent zeal for souls and desire to pray the rosary more faithfully. We come with confidence to you, O throne of grace and mother of fair love. Inflame us with the same divine fire which has inflamed your own sorrowful and immaculate heart. Make our hearts and homes your shrine and through us, make the heart of Jesus together with your rule triumph in every heart and home. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, well, I love these novenas, huh? What a wonderful way to, uh, uh, to draw us closer uh, to our Blessed Mother who always, remember her, she always wants to bring us closer to her son, always wants to bring us into deeper union and intimacy with her son, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ.
And so just today, a real short reflection. Is age just a number? So uh, one of the curious things you'll see in the scriptures is that the ages of the, of the people, you know, you say, well, how can somebody live that long? Well, here's something to think about. Now, of course, um, Adam and Eve, our first parents, there was no death in the beginning of creation, right? Before the fall, they weren't supposed to die. Uh, so they were supposed to have everlasting life. Uh, but because of the fall, because of the sin, death came into the world. And death, remember, means to, to cut yourself off from God's life. And so what happens, you'll notice, is that the ages get shorter and shorter, right? So Moses lived like 100 and something, 70 years, something like that. And then, um, uh, well, Noah lived a, a long life, you know, like a crazy amount of years. And then uh, uh, Abraham, you know, uh, um, you know Moses, uh, Abraham uh, had Isaac when he was 99 years old. And he had Moses, you know, uh, and Moses in Psalm 90 writes, our span is 70 years or 80 for those who are strong. Right? I think Moses lived a little longer than that, though. But you notice that there's kind of like a bell curve effect, right? There's supposed to be no death, and then the age is declining, and kind of bonds out about 70 or 80 years old. Now, and if, now, back then, if you were 70, 80 years old, you lived a long time. Because remember, even up until like the, the, 20, the beginning of the 20th century, you know, the late um, 19th century, early 20th century, people, we didn't live that long. Um, uh, because they didn't have uh, hospitals, they didn't have cures, medicines, they didn't have um, uh, cures for diseases and things like that, surgeries and different things that we kind of take for granted now. But um, because of those advances in technology and, and um, discoveries of different medicines and people living longer, eating better, we're living longer now than, uh, than any time in, in the past. Um, and so again, that bell curve effect kind of bottoms out, and now it's starting to go up a little bit again, right? Because of, of the things I mentioned, um, uh, you know, eating better, medicine, surgeries, exercise, all those kinds of things. So I, I bring this up to mention <laughs> there's a professor at the University of Oslo in Norway, and I'm going to butcher this name, uh, Juna Rasanen, R-A-S-A-N-E-N. Uh, and wrote wrote a, a study or a paper called the the case for legal age change, the case for legal age change. That means people can legally change their age, not their name, right? Not even their, their sex, but their age. And uh, in, the, in the study, the professor gives three criteria uh, that you can change, that morally you can change your age. One, when the person genuinely feels that his age differs significantly from his chronological age, okay? So the age that you actually feel differs, differs significantly from your actual chronological age, then you should be able to change your age because you don't feel your age. That's usually a compliment, isn't it? Wow, you don't look 70, you don't look 80, that's amazing, you look so great. You know, so is that a reason to change your age? Because you, how you feel doesn't match the reality of what it says on your birth certificate? That doesn't make sense to me. The second one the professor brings up, when a person's biological age is recognized to be significantly different from his chronological age. What you talking about? <laughs> the biological age is different, is different significantly from the chronological age. So again, whatever your, um, your, your body, you know, you're, 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 you have the body of a, you know, uh, you go to the doctor to get a physical, say you're 70 years old. Boy, you have the body of a 50-year-old. So that's the reason to change your name because your biological age doesn't match your chronological age. That's the reason to change your age, like legally change your age. That, that's, uh, no, it doesn't make any sense. And finally, uh, when age change will likely prevent or reduce or even stop ageism or discrimination because of age. So in order to not be discriminated against because you're elderly, uh, just change your age. So, you know, when you go to a job, or how old are you? Uh, well, you know, my birth certificate says 70, my max is 55. Because, you know, I don't want to be discriminated against because of my, and anyway, so is that, can I just change my race because I don't want to be discriminated against for being black? Come on, come on, <laughs> this, is, this is ridiculous. But, you know, this is the world that we're living in now, a world that wants to shape 
And instead of being made in the image and likeness of God, we want to make God in our own image and likeness. Remember the temptation of Satan, you will be like God. And so we think we can control things that we have no control over just because we feel a certain way or because we're taking care of ourselves. And, our, you know, and so our body's responding to the way we're taking care of ourselves, even though it doesn't match our, we're able to do things at an older age that most people at our age can't do. So that's, a, that's not a reason to change your age. Or, you know, look, the people that, that feel they need to change something like this about themselves, um, whether they need to change their age or they think they can change their sex, which you can't, because God's very clear, male or female, he created them. You know, um, you just can't change, you know, be, uh, your sex, your age, because you feel that way. Here's the thing. Why, I, I have thought, why do people want to do things like this? And I think the simple answer is that they're looking for something. They're searching. Yes, they're confused. We know that for sure. But they're looking for something. They're searching for something. They think that something in their life is missing. And uh, or they think they have a problem. And they think the problem can be fixed by changing a number on a legal piece of paper or by attempting to change your uh, your biological sex. Um, but what they're really searching for uh, is God, a deeper intimacy with God. But because they're not looking for God, they think they can find it in these other ways. And we live in a culture that just affirms what, if it feels good, do it. Whatever you feel like doing, that's what you should do. If it makes you happy, and if it doesn't, quote unquote, hurt anybody, then it's okay to do whatever you want. That's where we're living now. Here's the thing. As people of Christ, as followers of Jesus, as Catholics, we cannot affirm people and their confusion. We love them with the unconditional love of God. No, no question or doubt about it. We have to love God and love our neighbors ourselves. But we cannot confirm people and their confusion. And we're not talking about judging here. Remember the Catholic principle. We love everyone but we always don't love their actions and we judge actions. We never judge people. That's the principle. So I would challenge all of our friends out there who are, who think that in order to solve whatever problem that you're having, that you need to change something. You need to change your age, even though, you know, neglect the reality and the natural law of how God created you of what your actual chronological age is and think that somehow you, you're gonna find this magical fountain of youth that when all of a sudden when you, when you make this legal change on this piece of paper, all of your problems are gonna change. It's not, because you're not facing what you're, what you're really struggling with. You're not fulfilling the deepest desires of your heart, which is deep intimacy with the Lord. You know, and, and so, and, and if you don't go seeking truth, because Jesus, it says, I am the way, the truth, and life. The truth is not an idea. The truth is not a construct or philosophy. Truth is a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what you're looking for. And this culture confirms people in their confusion all the time, even in some states right now. If you, if you are a parent and your 12-year-old prepubescent child, who's a boy, says, I, I think I, I'm actually a girl. And they want to begin taking medications even before puberty even starts to stop the process of puberty, um, which, which to me is child abuse, plain and simple. Um, but, it, it, but if you don't allow that child to go through that process, this, in some states, they can come in and take your child out of the home and, and, and say that you're abusive parents because you're not allowing your prepubescent child to be in the process of, of, uh, of trying to change their sex, which of course they can't do. Um, you know, that, to, to me, that's, that is deeply, deeply problematic and symptomatic of the, of the ill and of the sin uh, and of the confusion that we're living in in our culture today. And so, again, we want to, uh, people that may be confused or struggling with this, we love you. We love you totally and unconditionally with the love of God. There's no question or doubt about that, but we absolutely cannot affirm you in your confusion. Seek Jesus. Seek the way, the truth, and the life, because it's finding him that will set you free. Set you free from the bonds. Set you free from the anxiety. Set you free from all the things you think are, that are causing you to believe or to think the way that you are right now. 
uh, I would seek help from a good Catholic counselor, someone who um, upholds the teachings of the church that will lead you in the right direction. Maybe a good solid priest as well for some spiritual direction. But don't just capitulate and cave into the culture because you'll make decisions that are unchangeable. You know, you'll make decisions that literally will affect you for the rest of your life. Remember, my friends, our actions have eternal consequences. So please keep that in mind. So I want to thank you and uh, for joining me for a, another Daily Dose of Deacon Harold. Um, please like and share these uh, videos that are coming to you via YouTube. I have a, a, an active YouTube channel. Please go ahead and subscribe to that. It doesn't cost anything. And you have access to about 550 videos or so that I have on there. If you go to my, my playlist, you'll see all the different categories I have the videos under. Um, including David L. Gray's um, uh, 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 review of my book on Father Tolton is also there on YouTube. And of course, um, you can catch me every morning co-hosting uh, EWTN's uh, morning show, Morning Glory, with Gloria Purvis and Monsignor Charles Pope. And uh, have a life coach, go to my website, deaconharold.com. You'll see the life coaching services and a bunch of other stuff there. Absolutely free on my social media, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, all of that, go ahead and hit me up on those. And don't forget, oh, just quickly, the Walk by Faith Wednesday webinar, we didn't have it yesterday. Um, I'm skipping until next Wednesday to have the Walk by Faith Wednesday webinar. We'll be talking about evangelization. How do we effectively talk to people and share the beauty and truth of our Catholic faith without being angry or resentful or turning people away and making them feel uh, rejected or feel like we, you know, we won the argument, we lost the person. You know, so how do we effectively do that? So thank you for joining me today. And as, as, as always, we'll end with, uh, with a prayer and a blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, life of the faithful, glory of the humble, happiness of the just, hear our prayers. Fill our emptiness with the blessing of the Eucharist, the foretaste of eternal joy. And we ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. And we'll see you tomorrow for another daily dose of Deacon Harold. God bless. <laughs>